moves the markets? Is this some mystical, invisible force that we have no control over? Has the future already been predetermined? Is it all related to the planets? These are good questions to ask as it relates to our philosophy toward trading. Regarding the belief that everything has been predetermined, if that is the case, then why bother wearing seatbelts, for an example? If your time's up, it shouldn't really make any difference if you wear your seatbelt, right? And don't bother reminding your kids to wear them either, because it shouldn't matter if you believe in fate. If you don't agree, then I would suggest that you explain your belief to the police when you get a ticket for not buckling up. Good luck with that. So no, we aren't powerless. We are not controlled by some mysterious forces of predestination, luck, fate, or anything else you want to call it. When I was a broker, I would often hear the question, why did this stock or future go up today? The answer to that question is proverbial and really quite simple. There were more buyers than sellers. And the converse is true when the price of something goes down. It really is that simple. But can't there be other reasons that would influence why prices went up or down? Sure. But let's first focus on the primary forces that influence prices. The first of the primary forces that move markets is the largest financial institutions on the planet, or funds. They could be banks, governments, pension funds, mutual funds, insurance companies, etc. These are large pools of diversified capital in multiple markets. These institutions place very large orders with firms that execute their orders on the various exchanges. These firms work the orders on the exchanges and love this type of business from the institutions because not only they get paid well to execute the order for the firm, they also use insider information to achieve their own ends by front running or putting orders in front of the institutional orders. But hey, isn't that illegal insider trading? Yes, it is. But it doesn't stop it. Similar to the fact that many people use drugs despite it being illegal. Insiders give lip service to the fact that insider trading and insider information is illegal. But this is a serious fact of life. It happens more than we want to think it does. Why? Well, put yourself in their shoes. Imagine that you were buried in debt, worried about your job, your wife's pregnant. Maybe you need some money for your kid's education. But then you get some inside information. It's 100% certainty that stock X will go up $10 by the close tomorrow. You think, wow, it's a once in a lifetime chance. Maybe this is my big break. I'll only do it once and then I'll never do it again. And if I do this, I can send my kids to school and I'll be doing it for a noble cause. So then he gets a second mortgage, maxes out his credit cards, begs, borrows, and does whatever he can to put on a huge position in the stock market, the futures market, single stock futures, options, whatever instrument he needs to play with to get that position on. Now, honestly, look at yourself. Would you do that? Hopefully your answer is no, but for a person that was raised in a non-spiritual eat or be eaten environment, you can understand why it happens. I don't think anyone grows up as a kid thinking that when I grow up, I want to be a white collar thief, but gradually it happens. Well, I thought that insiders have to report their trades to the public. Yes, that's true, but does that stop them from telling a friend to open an account and do some trading? When there is a will, there is a way. So every day, many, many, many insiders get rich at the expense of us, the outsiders. How? By putting orders in front of the institutions, by front running. Besides front running, the firm that executes the order for the large institution also executes orders for us, the little guys. So between the big institutions and the small speculators, there's plenty of money to be made from all this order flow.
every single trade, win, lose, or draw, they are getting paid. These large intermediaries that give us access to trade equities, derivatives, and spot forex can see all the orders that have to be filled. I remember one CTA told me that it's like playing cards on a glass table. And there's people underneath the, the table looking at your cards. Hey, I thought that the work that those firms do is good because they provide liquidity to the market. And they make sure that your orders get filled. Yes, that is true. They do provide liquidity. But I'd like to quote the late J.P. Morgan. This is what J.P. Morgan had to say. A man always has two reasons for doing anything. A good reason and the real reason. So yes, these specialists, market makers, brokers, they provide liquidity. But what is the real reason? Charity? No. The real reason is money. They get paid on every transaction. And so they love transactions and lots of them. So let's see how orders are filled in a typical trading day on an exchange. So here is an open high low close bar. Here's the open, here's the close, here's the low, here's the high. It's very common to see the open and the close of the day near the extremes of the bar, as you can see in this example. So why is that? At the beginning of a trading session, the brokers look at all the small orders that you and I place, but they're also very aware of the big orders that have to be filled for these large funds. So once the session starts, they try to hit all the small buy and sell stops on either side of the opening price. And they drive the market up and down to fill these orders. And yes, they make money doing that. They make some money, but the serious money is in the institutional business. First, they'll collect this, and then they'll move on. After this phase is complete, they look at the institutional orders. In this example, there's a huge block of shares that need to be purchased. So first, to protect themselves from market meltdown, they start buying options or futures to modify their position and reduce their risk to a level that's acceptable. Then about an hour after the open, the buying begins. Remember, these large orders really do move the markets, and it's the job of the firm that's working the order for the fund to get good fills. So to do that, they don't just hit the market with a huge order all at once, but they rather place a number of smaller orders at different levels over a period of days or weeks to get a reasonable price for their client. Placing this order in this manner ensures that us lemmings don't really find out what they're up to. And in exchange for all that business, they get lots of money, as you can see here. That's the bulk of their business from that trading day. Then as this trading day starts to draw to a close, about an hour before it closes, the brokers start liquidating their derivatives and start to clean out any other orders that might be in the general area of the price action before the close. So once again, they'll go about cleaning up whatever orders there are on either side of the market at that point going into the close and in exchange for that they get paid again so putting it all together they get a lot of money from this order flow from the institutions and the small speculators so we can see that this order flow really does have an impact on where the price of a financial instrument will end up a similar concept happens at options expiration. There's a lot of money made in the sale of options to the public. If an institution has collected a lot of premium on call options at say $50 and put options here at $40 and 
if all the premium that was sold to the public was at $50 and at $40, it is really in the interest of the institution to keep the price of the stock between $40 and $50 prior to the expiration date to make sure that options at $50 and $40 expire worthless. So you can see the market prior to expiration is up and down, up and down, not a problem. Uh, trading through the levels of $40 and $50. But once we start getting closer to option expiration, if it's to the advantage of the institution to have the market trade at a level, say in this example, around $45, then they will manipulate the market to keep the price there prior to option expiration. So you can see that the uh, price action has diminished. It's staying within a range here and they will keep it there until expiration so the large option sellers will artificially manipulate a market if necessary to ensure that they can collect as much premium as possible even if they lose some money pushing the market away from a strike price prior to option expiration this happens in the otc forex market as well even though there are no standardized strikes, the commonality is that the expiration of spot market options is always at 10 a.m. New York time, Monday to Friday. So beside these artificial forces that push the markets around to fleece the lemmings, what else moves the markets? Us, the little speculators. We're driven by fear and greed, right? Fear and greed are two of the many emotions that we feel when trading, but are they the only ones? No, it's a bit more complicated than that. Someone might buy a blue chip stock because he feels that it might be a safe place to park some of their money for a while. This person is not necessarily greedy when he purchases his stock. Or if a person invests with the intent of creating a profit for a charity, is that greed? I don't think so. And when a person sells a stock, they don't have to do it out of fear. Maybe they just need some extra cash to take their family on vacation. So we can't just say it's fear and greed. It has to be broader than that, a broader description. When people trade, they are primarily driven by emotions. People choose stocks based on emotion first. Then they look for information to support that emotional choice. And with all the tools we'll be looking at in this course, you'll see that these emotional choices can be predictable. There are identifiable patterns that tell us in advance that the market collectively is about to make an important decision that will affect its price. Let's now discuss this further and have a look at analysis of the financial markets in the section Fundamental versus Technical Analysis.